Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches direct sows squash, moonflowers, and cucumbers in her raised beds. OSU Extension Vegetable Crop Specialist Lynn Brandenberger has tips for when to plant your vegetables. We get a little more life out of a leaky hose. OSU Extension Pecan and Grape Specialist Becky Carroll is in the orchard to monitor curculio in our peaches. And Barbara Brown has a special guest to help us get the most from our poultry dollars. Well, you might buy tomato and pepper transplants because those tend to take longer and really you don't want to start those from seed directly in the garden because they take just too long to grow and produce in what our season allows. However, squash and zucchini are great vegetables to start directly in the garden from seed. So if, for again, for a couple of bucks, you can buy a couple of packages of whatever varieties you might want. Um, I've got some Black Beauty zucchini here, which is a really great uh, cultivar of uh, a zucchini, a summer squash. So what we're going to do is just plant these. Now keep in mind squash and zucchini really get to be large plants. So you're going to want to plant them about almost two and a half to three feet apart. So in this space right here, we're only going to plant uh, probably three holes. And in each hole, I'm going to put a couple of seeds. Again, that's just my insurance there. Um, but we're going to go ahead and plant our zucchini. And in order to do that, we're going to just dig down about an inch, not too far. Again, these are fairly small seeds. Traditional rule of thumb is to plant the seed two and a half times the diameter of the seed. And so you can see here, we've got small seeds. So I'm gonna go ahead and put two seed in there and then just cover those over. Come down here about two and a half feet. Again, dig another little hole. Nice thing about this is you don't have to get too dirty digging those holes because they're not going very far. And then we'll cover that over. I've already worked my soil. It's been tilled up quite a bit. So it's going to allow for those seedlings to establish themselves once they grow in. You can see here I've only planted probably six seeds in three different holes. We're probably going to end up cutting one of those seedlings back when we see which one is the stronger one and allow one to really establish that space. So I'll end up with hopefully three zucchini plants. Now I'm going to plant my uh, yellow squash in a different bed just somewhere else um, for today. And the other thing is, is you still have plenty of seeds left, which is nice because we all know that with squash you're going to get squash bugs and it's really difficult to um, battle those as we go through the season. And one way to do that is through succession planting. So in a couple of weeks I will plant a couple of more seeds so that you always have a nice crop of fresh squash and zucchini coming on board before those squash bugs get them. A lot of times people start their garden with transplants, but there are a few plants that you can directly sow the seeds straight into your garden in April. And along our vertical trellis here, we're gonna plant some cucumbers. Cucumbers are one of those plants that do well starting from seeds straight out into the garden. So you can't get much easier than that. For a couple of dollars, you'll get several seeds, which is kind of like insurance, because if one doesn't make it, you've got plenty of seeds to go around. So what we're going to do, our uh, trellis stakes here are about 16 inches apart, which works well for our spacing on our cucumbers. Now these seeds, they don't need any sort of pretreatment or anything. We're just open the package and we're going to plant them straight into the garden. We're going to plant those along each one of these stakes. And I'm going to go ahead again for insurance purposes, kind of plant one on both sides. So we'll plant one on this side. 
and I like to usually just go ahead and put a couple of seeds in that hole. Um, we'll see how many of them come up. If both of them come up and they're competing, then we might want to go ahead and clip one of those back. But then we're going to repeat that over on this side as well. And you're just going to dig down a couple of inches. These don't need to be too deep and then we'll cover them up. It's always nice to add a little bit of ornamental flowers into your vegetable garden just for some show. And so since we have this trellis here, I thought it would be nice to add some moonflower to the end caps of this. Now if you're not familiar with moonflower, it is a tropical annual vine, uh, which means it's only going to last for one season. But the nice thing about this is that it has large white flowers and it's quite a vigorous vine. So you're going to get a lot of production off of it and you're going to have these beautiful big white flowers. And the nice thing and the reason why it has its name Moonflower is because it tends to bloom later in the evening into early morning. So if you're like many people that come home late from work and a lot of your flowers have closed up by the end of the day, Moonflower is one that's still going to be open. And also because it's white, whenever we have any ambient light or moonlight, it's definitely going to be reflective. So when you can stroll out into your garden, you're still going to see these beautiful flowers showing. Now in order to plant this moonflower, one thing you want to know, and it, it tells you this if you buy the seed packets, is that this particular one likes to be soaked um, overnight. And so you can see here, I've got a lot of baby food jars laying around the house these days. And so I've gone ahead and soaked these seeds overnight, um, which has allowed them, I'm just going to pour this out a little bit so you can see, has allowed them to kind of swell up a little bit. That water has imbibed that seed and has started it off. Um, and so now at this point, we're ready to go ahead and plant them into the garden soil. And we're just going to do one. Again, these are fairly small seeds, so we're only going to go down about half an inch or so and plant it on either side of the end here of our trellis. Now, if you see, some of them kind of look funny. This one looks a little different than these others. So I'm a little bit curious if this one, maybe something's wrong with it or it might not germinate as well. So I'm gonna go with the majority of the ones that look similar like these here. So now we've got our trellis planted. We should see the moonflowers germinate in about five to 10 days and the cucumbers might take a little longer, about eight to 10 days. Um, but we're gonna keep an eye on it. We're gonna water these seeds in and also kind of keep that bed moist because those will start to sprout um, and the slightest dryness can desiccate that seed or kill that seed. So be sure to watch for any sprouts and if we have any late freezes, go ahead and cover them with something as well. Good afternoon, my name is Lynn Brandenberger and I work for Oklahoma State University in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture. This afternoon I wanted to spend just a few minutes and talk a little bit about planting your garden or planning would be a better term for it. Uh, one of the things that we see every spring is that we all get excited about gardening and we rush over to whatever garden center that we operate in and we buy a bunch of transplants and we go home and we dig up the soil and we plant them in the soil and we're all excited and uh, the next thing you know about a week or so later we hear on the news that the temperature is supposed to get pretty cold and we go well I don't know that might, might, might make it through that and so that night our summer garden gets frozen out. That's things like warm season vegetables like tomatoes or peppers and all that kind of group. Might even have some cucumbers or something transplanted. Uh, those are very sensitive to, to low temperatures. Uh, the good news is that really helps people that grow transplants because they don't only sell one set of transplants every year, they might sell two or three sets. But it doesn't really help you as a home gardener. So one of the things that Oklahoma State's done, and, and I got to give uh, David Hillock some credit, put together this nice uh, planning 
guide for the garden. And uh, on this, it kind of breaks crops down into cool season and warm season crops. It gives uh, the time of the year or actual dates when they ought to be transplanted or planted into the garden. And that's a, a great thing to go by. Uh, that way, more times than not, you'll get your cool season crop at the right time and you'll get your warm season crop in at the right time. Now, this being Oklahoma, it's not guaranteed because we know, and I've seen it since I've been here, freezes in May, which is really odd and unusual, but weird stuff happens, right? We're in Oklahoma, we have really challenging weather. So I'd advise you to check this out. Uh, kind of keep this as your guide, uh, maybe in your gardening notebook, and uh, think about when you're going to plant things. Uh, plant them at the right time of the year. Uh, we have cool season crops in our garden right now, and uh, they're growing like gangbusters, but they'll be done in about a month. Our warm season crops, like tomatoes, peppers, etc., will actually go in the ground probably this next week. So, hope you're having a great day, and stay safe. There's really nothing better than a tree ripened peach in the summer, um, but it's not that easy just to plant a tree and, and let it go. Uh, peach trees require quite a bit of care to get a, a crop every year. And so one of the things that we have to really watch for is um, an insect called plum curculio. It's a weevil, it's native to our area, and it overwinters in leaf litter, in wooded areas around your yard, or around your trees. And then in the spring they come out and they uh, look for the fruit on the tree. And so that's why we recommend spraying insecticides from petal fall until uh, harvest time because they're continuously um, affecting your fruit load. So today I'm going to show you a way just to see if you have some, some plum curculio in your tree. So I've put out a sheet here on the ground. You can use um, a tarp or a towel or something, but this is, is bright white so it's going to be a little bit easier to see. And we're going to just shake a limb and see if we can get, um, see if we see any curculio on the ground. So um, let's just see uh, what we find here. Here's, an, here's one that has fallen. Here's a curculio that's fallen on the, on the tarp. We shook another limb and you can see um, it pretends that it, it's dead. And in a few minutes, it may hop up and, and run off very quickly. Um, but, but there is some damage to the peaches on this tree already. So uh, whenever the plum curculio feeds on the peaches when they're young, they usually end up dropping off. And so a lot of people comment that their peaches all fell off the tree. Well, a lot of the time that's due to, um, to insect feeding. And then if they, are, um, if they affect the feed on those fruits later in the season, you'll end up with um, worms in your peaches. And so I don't usually mind sharing a, a peach with a, with a curculio larva but I know most people don't. So you can cut around them and, and eat the rest of the peach, but if they're, um, if they're damaged pretty severely, a lot of the time there won't be any fruit even that are harvestable. So this is one thing that we wanted to, to look at. I've got some other curculio um, that we can show you what the adults look like, but they lay their eggs, they make a crescent-shaped scar on the fruit, and then those eggs hatch and they, the larvae feed on the peach, traveling towards the pit. And so that's what's really causing the damage. The, uh, the, where they lay the egg, it also makes a misshapen place. And so the cells don't divide properly, so you get some, some odd looking fruit as well. But it's very important to make sure that you're applying fungicides and insecticides every 10 to 14 days from petal fall until harvest time to combat this, path, this pest. Curculio not only affect peaches, they affect other stone fruits like plums and nectarines and apricots, but they also affect palm fruits like apples and pears. 
So if you'd like more information, you can check out this fact sheet that talks about how to monitor and about their life cycle. It can be frustrating coming out of winter to find that your hose is cracked and leaking. This is why it's always important to put away your hoses, but in case you didn't and you find that you've got this situation, we're going to show you an easy way to repair your hoses. It's important to repair your hoses because if you're like me, a lot of times you just don't have enough hose to go around to stretch to all your plants. And so if you can salvage a good portion of that hose, it's important to do that before you go spend anywhere from $30 to $80 on a brand new hose. The first thing that you're going to want to do is identify where that leak is and mark either side of that. After you've marked both sides of the hose and around the damaged area, then you're going to want to turn off your water and allow it to dry so that you can cut it easily. You can use whatever tool to cut the hose. Many different tools will work, but something that saws tends to tear the fibers in the hose a little bit more than scissors, which make a cleaner cut. So when you go to the store and you're in the hose section looking for the repair parts, there's going to be a couple of different options that you can find and purchase. Now the most important thing to know when you're going to the store, before you leave home, figure out what size hose you have. Two of the most popular size hoses are a 5 8 and also a 3 quarter inch hose. So here we have a 5 8 inch hose, so we need to make sure that we're buying the correct uh, materials for that. There's also a couple of different options that you can buy. So you can see here we've got some fittings that say female hose adapter. So again, these are the two different sizes and this is the female side of it. Now this is the male side and the reason why is because it goes into this. So you could use this option where you put one in there and the other in here and then these will attach like a normal hose. And so that's going to allow you to detach whatever uh, piece that you have remaining that you're wanting to repair. Now each one of these costs a few dollars, so these are two different pieces that you're going to have to buy. Now if you're looking to really just mend your hoses so that you have it as a full length hose, what you're going to look for is um, this sort of a piece right here. And basically you can see it works its way into both ends of that hose that you just cut. And then it's got these ring clamps that you can then clamp down on that. So we're going to show you how to install one of these. But if you can't find one of these, you can also find the male and female a lot of times and use that as well. So once you get your equipment that you're going to need, your tools, and you're going to need a flathead screwdriver as well to tighten those clamps around the hose, you want to make sure to put the clamps on the hose first before you insert the piece. Then once you've inserted the piece into one end, go ahead and tighten that clamp around that piece as solid as you can. You'll then next put the clamp around the other end of the hose before you insert that piece again. So you're now inserting the second side of that into the other piece of the hose that you'll attach. And again, you want to tighten it down with your flathead screwdriver. So there you have it. We've got a repaired hose. Now it's not the prettiest, and in fact this hose is probably on its last leg anyway, but it's good enough that we'll get another season before we have to drop another $50 on another hose. <music> Back in the day, we all had a lot of skills that we learned at our mother's elbow or at our grandmother's elbow in the kitchen. And one of those things that we all learned how to do was how to cut up a chicken. For a long time, a lot of us have relied on supermarkets to have meat cut into the pieces that we need. But as we go through the COVID process of adjusting to things, one of the things we're probably going to see is that some of the things we've relied on having done at the store for us are things we will have to do ourselves now. So today I've got Jake Nelson, who's the meat processing specialist for the Robert M. Kerr Food and Agriculture Processing Center, and he's going to help you learn how to cut up a chicken because you may have trouble finding the component parts that you've relied on in the past at the store. When you buy a whole chicken at uh, your retailer, it's very common to find them in a plastic bag like this. And it's even just as common 
that water or purge, or uh, we call it myoglobin, it's liquid protein, it's not blood, and you can see it pooling there in that. Uh, that represents a food safety risk for cross-contamination in your kitchen. So it's smart to use a, an old cake pan or some kind of device to contain this when you open this package so that you're not slinging this purge all over the kitchen. So here's the whole chicken out of the bag. You can see that there's uh, some purge already coming out. I think the generally accepted um, recommendations from food safety officials out there are to not wash these chickens in a sink. You can cause uh, splatter and cross-contamination broadly. It's better to keep it as dry as possible so that you can see where, uh, where this purge is. So we've got this whole chicken here and uh, we don't want to eat it whole. We want to cut it up into the typical parts and pieces that we're accustomed to seeing oftentimes in the retail setting. So I trimmed a little bit of excess fat back there by the vent. The first thing that I prefer to do is to start with these leg quarters. And a leg quarter is the drumstick uh, coupled with the thigh, which sits right down in here. You'll notice there's kind of a little balloony appearance to the skin here. We're just gonna open that up just like so. And uh, you can do as much fabrication with your hands without a knife as you can with a knife. You can just kind of pull that apart. You'll see a natural seam here and I'm gonna cut down, stay away from that wing, and right up where this, uh, this thigh bone comes up and joins to the, the vertebral column near the breast, there's a, a joint down in there. And if you kinda of peel that away, you can kinda of find where that bone goes into that joint and cut right through it. And then apply a little bit of pressure and it'll just pop right open there for you. And there I've separated that leg quarter from the rest of the chicken comprised of the thigh and the drumstick. If I want to further separate that, you'll kind of see another kind of a natural seam where the two join. There's a, you can see the fat right there. And we're just gonna cut right down through that and there's a cartilaginous joint. Just cut all the way through that. It's soft enough, these chickens are young enough that you're, you're, a good knife will just cut right through that. And there's the first cut, the drumstick. We'll set that over here and here is then a bone-in, skin-on thigh. As with any cut, if you want to make it boneless and skinless, you take the bone and the skin out. And um, it's just that, that simple. These skins peel off nicely. Trim a little excess fat there. And then the bone portion, you can just carefully take your knife down in there against the bone, cut away from your hand, remove that bone portion, Use that cutting table to your advantage. And there you've got some thigh meat. After that, uh, we're gonna take these wings off. And uh, the wings are a very popular item. And again, they come and attach at a joint down here where the wing comes up and joins the rest of the body. And you just gently take your knife in there, kind of expose that, and cut right down through it. And then again, you can find the joints. Anywhere you see a bend in the structure of that appendage, there's gonna be a joint. So I can just come right here into the point of these two and cut right through. And that cartilage separates nicely. We can go ahead and cut this tip off if we'd like. There's just a lot of bone down in here. Again, this chicken is, is soft and pliable. And if you don't hit that joint properly, you run the risk of slipping and cutting yourself. So again, as I talk to you with a Band-Aid on my finger, always be mindful of how you're handling your knife and uh, how you're handling the product. What's left then are uh, the two breast halves and the neck and then the back. And uh, this is probably the, one of the, the most difficult tasks to do properly. And I'm gonna go to my bigger knife. It's a little longer, gives me a little more leverage to separate this uh, breast portion from the back. I like to stand this up and put the front of, the, of the, the chicken down and I'm just gonna take my knife straight down where it's gonna rub against uh, the breast bone, leaving the majority of the ribs that you can see down in there with the back. So I'm just gonna come in and cut straight down. There's a cartilaginous joint there that you can kind of find and hear and feel. Cut right through that. 
And then there is the whole bone-in breast portion and the back that remains. If you want to finish the breast off, you could leave it whole like this. Uh, we're going to go all the way down and make uh, at least one boneless, skinless chicken breast. It comes off rather easily. Set that skin aside. Turn it over. And essentially, we're just going to have to cut right through this breast bone. And that's why I like a larger, sturdier knife. Uh, and I'm just going to lay that in there and get it started. And then use both hands without cutting myself and separate that breastbone. Once you have all of those parts cut and separated, what you have remaining then are the bones if you deboned it. You have the back and some skin. There's a number of things you can do with this. Um, my, uh, my mother growing up would put that in a pot of water and cook that down, get the meat off, make a stock, make a broth. There's a number of recipes for that. And then you've got the cuts to go with it. Next week, Casey will have a kaleidoscope of coleus. Lynn Brandenburger will be back with tips for living mulch in raised beds and high tunnels. Oklahoma urban and community forester Mark Bays will cut through the confusion on tree pruning. And Becky Carroll will pick a peck of petite peaches. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.